Hi, my name is Corey Myers, and I'm a paleoecologist at the University of New Mexico. I'm going to talk to you today about estimating past distributions using ecological niche modeling. We'll do some methods. We'll do some applications. First, a little bit about me. Here's me in South Dakota. I have just pulled a beautiful ammonite fossil out of that outcrop there. This is what the fossil uh, looks like today. And this is a reconstruction of what that animal might have looked like about 65 million years ago. So I study how these animals uh, from the late Cretaceous, so between about 100 million years ago and 65 million years ago, responded to environmental changes. And I do this from the lens of how species migrated in response to environmental change, how they may have gone extinct, and how they may have speciated or created new species. I do this in the context of ecological niche models as applied to the deep time fossil record. And then I try to use these applications in deep time to better understand or to potentially inform um, our ways of thinking about current and future environmental change and how that might affect the planet's biodiversity. So I look at macroevolutionary questions that are grounded in paleobiogeography. And some of the specific kinds of questions that I'm interested in fall under kind of two main headers. The first being, how do species respond to changing environmental conditions? Under this, we might think about how geologic and climatic processes might influence evolution and whether species responses or whether taxon responses to environmental change are unique to a particular species. Perhaps instead they're unique to groups of species or clades. Maybe entire communities can respond to environmental change in, in a uh, locked or specific fashion. Do particular, particular ecological functional groups respond to environmental change in, in predictable ways? Or can we uncover any universal rules to how life period uh, might respond to changing environments over time? I'm also interested in trying to better quantify and observe how species abiotic niches may be conserved. I do this at a couple different scales. The first is looking at whether niches are stable or whether they might change or adapt to different conditions during a species lifetime. And then I'm also interested in the question of whether uh, if species have stable niches during their lifetime, whether a speciation event uh, might actually result in modification of abiotic niches or whether they're phylogenetically conserved. So in a more simple way, do sister taxa tend to have abiotic niches that are more similar uh, to each other than species that are um, less closely related. And in this sort of same vein, if we understand these first two questions a little bit better, then we might be able to answer this third question, which is whether niches, abiotic niches, might actually be pro a property that is unique to a species, and uh, in particular, unique to the species level. So why do we care about these types of questions? And I would argue that it's important to think about macroecology and paleobiogeographic patterns in the fossil record because this provides us with a lot of information of how species have responded to environmental change that can impact how we think about modern changes to environment. So even the best um, modern biological and ecological studies span decades, but we know that species actually persist for millions of years. And so we need to then look at the fossil record to get a better sense for the full lifetimes of those species. In that way, the fossil record can tell us something about the long-term effects of environmental change. Of course, the resolution in the fossil record, uh, the temporal resolution is much shorter. So it's not gonna tell us something about short-term, decadal to 100-year uh, timescales of how populations or communities are changing, but it can tell us how a species that lives uh, for hundreds of thousands to millions of years might respond to climate changes or other environmental changes on similar timescales. So I'm showing you here a plot on the, on the left 
where we're looking at things like how the formation of oceans might have impacted when fossil organisms were, were not just first found, but actually evolved, how uh, the advent of oxygenic photosynthesis uh, plays into atmospheric developments at the same time, um, and onwards up through kind of the history of complex life. So using the fossil record, we can really get at trying to understand whether biogeographic patterns and how they relate to evolution might vary not just by taxon, but also by style of climatic regime. So climate changes at a variety of different temporal scales, um, and we can actually look at different temporal scales in the fossil record uh, to test our hypotheses. So kind of what, how do I see this playing out, this link? So in this sense, looking at fossil record data, we have a very well-known relationship between geographic range and extinction resistance. So this is Jablonski back in the 1980s, demonstrating that species that have the largest geographic range sizes, and that's shown by the open circles in this plot, tend to live much longer than species with the smallest geographic range sizes, and that's shown uh, by these black filled in circles. We have less fossil uh, data, but we're starting to compile it about the impacts of habitat fragmentation and how that's related to species extinction. However, in the modern, we have some very good uh, evidence to support. Uh, this is this plot here on the left now is um, IUC red list, red list threat status species. And you can see that the endangered and critically endangered groupings um, are species that are also showing the highest degree of habitat fragmentation. So we have um, a record in the modern and in, and in fossils to kind of suggest that geographic range and fragmentation of habitats may have important evolutionary context. So I like to show this. Uh, geographically with a little cartoon, so bear with me. What you're looking at here is North America 85 million years ago. At that time, there was a shallow ocean that covered the central portion um, of the U.S. and Canada, and it was called the Western Interior Seaway. So I like to illustrate this um, in a little cartoon way by showing two, uh, two types of populations of my favorite group, uh, the ammonites. So we have a purple ammonite that might have a very large geographic range. We have a green ammonite that has a small geographic range. You might expect that your purple ammonite is, has more resistance to extinction just by virtue of chance. If, you know, an asteroid hits or some anoxic event occurs in the southern parts of uh, North America, that's going to have a significant impact on the survivorship of this small ranged green species, but our purple species also has suitable habitat and range um, that exists uh, in the northern parts of that ocean, and so they might be expected to sail through just fine. In a similar vein, our large ranged purple species might be more likely to um, expand their ranges into new habitats as they open up through time. So now you're looking at a picture of uh, the Western Interior Seaway on the left from 85 million years ago, and the Western Interior Seaway 10 million years later when you've opened up uh, this arm of the ocean um, through the northeastern parts of Canada. So again, our large range species might be expected to um, find and occupy that new habitat more readily than our small range species, both from the perspective of it's more likely to be nearby to Habitat, habitat that is becoming newly accessible, and also because it potentially has um, a larger range of tolerances of environmental conditions that it can kind of expand into new habitats. So this brings us to the BAM diagram. I don't think any uh, of the e 2020 talks will be complete without uh, one reference or two to this, um, to this way of thinking but we'll look at it from my perspective. So BAM diagram again is describing sort of three basic features that are thought to um, define or control uh, geographic range of a, of a given taxon. The first is abiotic factors. We might think about this as that Hutchinsonian fundamental niche. These are things like temperature and precipitation. The second is biotic interactions. I think of these as necessary but non-exclusive biotic interactions that allow a species 
to um, be successful and reproduce. And then, of course, the movement circle, um, which to my thinking essentially describes dispersal ability, where your abiotic and biotic circles interact, is where you have potentially suitable habitat. We call this the invadable area. And then where you actually find your species is the occupied area, and that would be invadable area limited by the ability of your species to get to those good habitats. So how does this then play out when we're thinking about species distributions? So for the next several slides, we're going to have my geographic picture on the right and um, a picture of environmental space on the left. And this is an entirely hypothetical um, exercise here. So we have on the right our, our large range, geographic range size ammonite species in purple. That's represented by this large uh, purple box in our environmental space. Similarly, we have our small geographic range ammonite species in green represented by a green box in environmental space. So when we're thinking about what leads to uh, or what controls for large geographic range sizes, one thing that ENM can help us, one set of hypotheses that ENM can help us uh, test uh, pretty robustly is the question of to what degree abiotic niches or abiotic tolerances are important. So if we're looking at these geographic ranges, we might hypothesize that our large geographic range species is actually that range size is controlled by having a large niche breadth. So that's what's depicted in this large purple box here on the left. Similarly, we might predict that our small geographic range species has a small niche breadth, and that's depicted by that small green box on the left. Okay, so what happens then when you have some sort of environmental change that degrades or removes some portion of the available environmental space? So this is akin to my example of the southern part of North America becoming unsuitable for these ammonite species for whatever reason. You can see in our environmental map that if this is uh, niche-related, that Again, it would be more likely for the small niche breath species to be fully affected by that environmental change as opposed to a species that has a much larger niche breath and can sort of retain uh, some portion of niche space um, even though ha um, environmental habitats had been degraded. So we might predict that large niche breath species then have decreased potential for loss of all suitable habitat and therefore some sort of resistance to extinction. Alternatively, we would predict that small niche breath species have increased potential uh, for loss of all suitable habitat and therefore an increased potential to go extinct. And we've played around with this um, in our virtual species modeling group and, and kind of um, validated these results using virtual species or these hypotheses. Okay, in a similar fashion, we can ask questions about habitat fragmentation. So again, on the top, you're looking at the environmental space um, and the geographic space occupied by our large and small niche breadth species. And then now on the bottom left, you're looking at uh, some sort of environmental change that might fragment um, habitat. If we just remove some of these in the environmental space that exists geographically, then this could lead to uh, separation of populations geographically, okay? So if that's the case, then our small niche breath species is probably more likely to be affected by fragmentation than our large niche breath species, which is more likely to have conditions uh, that allow for habitat continuity. So that brings us to a hypothesis, large niche breath, decreased potential for habitat fragmentation, and then decreased consequences, a decreased chance of speciation and extinction potential. Similarly, small niche breath, increased potential for habitat fragmentation, increased potential for speciation and extinction. And again, we've sort of tested these ideas out in a virtual uh, world uh, framework and found that um, broadly, these are valid hypotheses to test data. Okay, so what are the kinds of uh, testable hypotheses that we can use with this framework in the fossil record? Well, so we can look at survivorship. Is extinction caused by a complete lack of suitable habitat? Do you see extinction resistance in species that have large niche breadth? We can think about invasion bio biogeography. How do species um, 
I'm sorry, do species invade because their suitable habitat expands? Do you have increased invasion potential in species with large niche breadth? We can ask whether species distributions writ large are primarily controlled by uh, the sort of geographic spread of their abiotic preferences. And in the same vein, through time, do we see species tracking those preferred environments? And then we can get into the nitty gritty of whether niches are stable or whether they can be modified or adapted across the lifetime of a species. And if they're stable, then are niches phylogenetically conserved, which is to say more similar and closely related species. This has important implications for speciation theory. If you think about um, Darwin's sort of original views of speciation occurring because of strong biotic, strong negative biotic interactions that sort of make you want to do something different in order to, in order to survive in a, in a competitive world. If species are phylogenetically conserved, uh, this suggests that when species speciation happens, you're not having this um, sort of dramatic modification in uh, niche occupation that's associated with that. And that then kind of supports uh, the ideas of geographic speciation or allopatries um, that Meyer has suggested uh, more than this idea that competition drives speciation. And, you know, if, if niches are phylogenetically conserved and if they're stable across a species lifetime, then we can start asking about whether abiotic niches might be heritable characters of species. And this has important um, implications for, our, for ideas about selection, higher level selection. So we might think about if species uh, can be selected upon, then you need to have species level characters that exist uh, for selection to act on. And if um, abiotic niches or abiotic niche breath is one of those characters, then um, now you have something to work with. So this sort of revitalizes that, that conversation. Okay, so as um, has been discussed by several um, of the previous lectures, with ecological niche modeling, um, what we're primarily doing and certainly what I'm doing in, in estimating past distributions is, is trying to estimate what this abiotic niche is of these species um, using uh, fossil occurrence data and fossil environments. We hope, or we wish, uh, that, that what this technique can do is estimate the fundamental niche of these taxa. However, we know that that is um, kind of a pipe dream, and instead probably what we are estimating um, is something much more similar to a potential niche, which is still very useful. Um, and allows us still to, to test a lot of these interesting hypotheses. So, um, how does niche modeling work? Uh, we've talked about this probably before, but just a basic review. We have a lot of species occurrence data. We correlate those uh, using a multivariate statistical correlation with the um, combinations of environmental conditions that occur at those places and contrast that with combinations of environmental conditions that exist um, where your species do not. So what you're looking at here is a distribution of um, cone snails and then that gets correlated with um, in red sea surface salinity and sea surface temperature since I primarily work in the marine world. What the niche modeling algorithm does then is it gives you a prediction in environmental space. So essentially it's taking this, it's doing this multivariate correlation, it's drawing a circle around the environmental space where your, where your species occur, plus you hope a little bit of extrapolation uh, in good ways, and you get an estimate of, um, or a prediction of what might be suitable and a prediction of what is not suitable. Okay, and now this is in geographic, or sorry, this is an environmental space. The power then is that you can take these environmental uh, space predictions and you can place those back on geography and start testing hypotheses of species distributions and their ordinary consequences through time. And that might look something like this, um, where red are areas that are predicted to be good for this little cone snail species and blue are areas that are predicted to be bad. And you can imagine if you have a good fossil record, you can be doing this through time and start comparing how these maps look different across time and space. Okay, so when you're applying ecological niche modeling to the fossil record, then 
there's two basic ways that this can happen. The first is that um, is is the reconstruction of environmental data based on global climate models. So global climate models or GCMs, I'm showing you sort of a simple simple picture of a very complex process here on this slide. Essentially, you're you're um, compiling massive um, analyses of earth conditions using several different kinds of proxies to get a sense for what ocean and atmospheric circulation is doing at a given time. And then you can reconstruct spatial coverages of environmental gradients like uh, temperature, sea surface salinity, precipitation, etc. In the fossil record, these need to take into account things like bathymetry, uh, elevation, and the role of, of tectonic plate motion. Uh, you need to take into account how sea level has been modified through time um, and use a variety of proxy data to try to model what ocean circulation patterns looked like. Um, these models rely heavily on estimates of what the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide was at various times in the past. Um, in the, the near past, these can be directly measured from ice cores. And as you get farther back in time, you're starting to use geochemical proxies from the rock record uh, to, to estimate um, um, carbon dioxide levels and temperature. And then you might uh, use other paleoenvironmental indicators uh, that, that may be more kind of dial turning, like wind speed and direction or cloud cover. And all of this, again, these different factors then feed into how heat is transported around the globe. Um, through coupled ocean atmosphere uh, interactions. Okay, so if you have a global climate model, then all you need to do essentially um, is download those spatial coverages that result from this model um, and pair those with your species occurrence data and you can essentially uh, run ecological niche models in a very similar fashion to how modern ENMs um, are run. So here's an example from uh, Marsbeck. Marsbeck is a source for um, ocean climate layers in the marine realm. Um, I'm showing you here four different spatial coverages from Marsbeck. One is distance from shore, bathymetry, uh, salinity, and mean sea surface temperature. So you can download these data from the Marsbeck website, pair those with your uh, fossil occurrence data. You need to apply presence only occurrence algorithms because you don't have any information about absences. Um, and then you're off to the races. However, there are some caveats even to using uh, GCM-based uh, fossil ENMs. One is that you have issues of temporal resolution. So this is um, another image from uh, the Marspec website. And you can see that uh, Marspec provides data from 6,000 years ago and from 21,000 years ago. That's pretty good. Um, but if you want to know Con what continuous environmental change is happening between 21,000 years and, and present, that data is not available. Those model runs don't exist. Um, so you have a limited number of, of time bins with which you can um, download these, this GCM-based data. From that perspective, time bins might be separated by too much time or too little time. And then you're going to want to um, dig into the... Um, uh, supplemental data here to figure out how much time averaging is um, is implied in this model. So, you know, the mid-Holocene model is for 6,000 years, but how much time is being averaged to provide you with the information that you're that you're given? Is it a thousand years? Is it the last hundred years of the model, um, etc.? What's the sort of temporal bin size? There's also some spatial resolution issues that have to be um, considered when you're using GCM-based um, environmental layers, uh, things like most of the uh, actual data that's collected to create these models is, is collected at the regional scale, and then you're sort of combining varying temporal resolutions uh, to build these global scale models. You also have an issue of, of spatial grain size, um, and so you, you may run into the problem where the spatial resolution of your occurrence data doesn't match the spatial resolution of your environmental layers, and you have to figure out how to um, match those. 
it's not very hard um, to increase the grain size uh, from of a GCM environmental layer. It's a lot harder to actually downscale um, or take, you know, kilometer resolution um, environmental data and figure out what the structure of that is at the subkilometer scale. Okay, so those are sort of basic caveats that you need to think about with, in fact, any kind of um, environmental data, whether it's modern environmental data or or um, GCM based. So. Beyond these sort of standard caveats, there is the major caveat of how good is your global climate model. The farther back in time you go, the more difficult it is to estimate a lot of these parameters. So estimating things like elevation and bathymetry get very difficult, particularly when you go, um, when you get hundreds of millions of years into the fossil record. Things like sea floor, floor spreading rates, um, are also are very difficult um, to accurately pin down. So as you're trying to sort of reconstruct paleogeography, that becomes more difficult. Um, making a distinction between global or eustatic sea level from signals of regional sea level it can be very difficult as you go back in time. And then um, there's always issues surrounding any kind of geochemical proxy of paleo environments. So as an example, um, when you're trying to estimate what atmospheric CO2 concentrations are, uh, these types of proxies are influenced by um, sampling frequency. Often these measurements are done on fauna or flora, and you have to ask whether there are vital effects that might be uh, masking uh, true environmental signals. And then there's always the worry um, of how the formation and modification of those rocks, so diagenetic processes may have reset the original chemical signal um, of, of the environment in which that rock was formed. Okay, and then of course, um, for things like clouds and wind speed and direction, there's no real available proxies. And so um, in those cases, for those types of, of um, boundary conditions, a lot of times it's a lot of dial turning to kind of best fit what makes sense given um, the remaining available data. Okay, so all, all this to say, um, global climate models are still a model, and so they're still subject to, you know, the rule of models, uh, in which, you know, all models are probably not quite accurate, uh, but some of them are, are useful. And so it, it, it's a good idea to be, to be um, clear and also a little bit skeptical about your GCM models and the quality of their data before uh, just kind of going with a download and and um, and then assuming that the model is the gospel truth. Okay, so in this sense, you can really lump modern ENM and GCM-based recent past ENM together. And I'm I'm going to suggest to you today that uh, this style of ENM is um, different than deep time ENM, um, which I call paleo ENM. So just as a brief overview of some of these similarities and differences, both methods are using geographic species occurrence data. Um, some of the differences then are that modern or GCM based uh, niche models have limited or no temporal context, whereas deep time paleo ENM has um, great stratigraphic context of your occurrences and your paleo environment paleo environmental data. Both of these types of analyses are using are using spatially interpolated environmental coverages. So even though you can go to WorldClim and download um, spa a spatial coverage of um, uh, temperature across the entire globe, uh, that spatial coverage is based on an interpolation between many different weather stations. So even modern environmental gradients um, still have some degree of um, spatial interpolation, and the fossil record, of course, is no different. The differences, however, are in uh, the number of measurements. Certainly, there are many more in, uh, in modern and GCM-based ENM than there are in deep deep time uh, paleo ENM. And then of course in, in modern or, or near time um, applications of ENM, you can directly measure some of these environmental variables. So 
you know, even going back 800,000 years, we can look at ice core data to actually measure what uh, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 was, for example. We don't have any direct measurements of oceans, temperatures, or rainfall uh, in deep time, and so we need to use sedimentological and geochemical proxies then um, for those factors um, in, in deep time. Okay, both of these methods can use presence-only ENM algorithms. These are things like Maxent, GARP, or BioClim. Um, the advantage of doing modern or recent time um, ENM is you might have a better sense for uh, real absences, at which point you can use presence absence uh, algorithms like GAMS. Um, because of the preservation uh, quality of organisms in the fossil record, it's never smart uh, to assume that you have information about absences. Um, and I recommend only using presence only algorithms um, at that time. And in a similar, uh, similar kind of line of thinking, uh, both of these uh, styles of, of niche models have some degree of sampling bias in both their uh, species occurrence and environmental data. You can only go into the field for some, uh, so much time to observe whether your, your taxon of choice exists there in the modern. Um, and it's the same thing with the fossil record. The difference being, of course, uh, that you hope you have a higher probability to observe modern flora and fauna than you do uh, with the preservation potential of fossils. So um, in this sense, modern and ne uh, recent past GCM-based ENMs um, can be, uh, can test hypotheses um, at the level of populations, species, and clades probably. However, in the deep time fossil record, we're really limited to um, um, hypotheses uh, pertaining to species and clades. Okay, so what I work on then, I'm going to kind of show you how we uh, how we reconstruct deep time uh, uh, distributions using paleo ENM now, um, and I'll use my work in the late Cretaceous as an example. So I work um, in the marine realm um, in the late Cretaceous, which was between about 165 million years ago. This is approximately what the globe might have looked like at that time based on uh, paleogeographic and sea level analyses. Um, it's a greenhouse climate, so everywhere is a little bit warmer. There is little or even no um, polar glacial ice. As opposed to um, several uh, north-south oceans, the Cretaceous is dominated by this kind of equatorial Tethys Sea, so ocean circulations patterns are a bit different. And we have a, a reduced latitudinal temperature gradient. And this is, is really based on the observation that you have palm trees and crocodiles and other cold-blooded animals that uh, are preserved in Antarctica, um, which suggests that Antarctica was quite warm. And at the same time, you still have a vibrant tropical community. So um, the tropics are not have not warmed up to the same degree as the poles. The poles have experienced more warming. And so you have this reduced latitudinal gradient. I work in the Western interior, shown by this little white area arrow. This is a restricted epicontinental sea. It's pretty shallow, probably not more than 100 meters at its deepest. Um, over the 35 million years that this ocean or that this seaway was open to both the Arctic Sea um, and the Gulf of Mexico, it had variable bottom water oxygenation and a lot of freshwater input um, from um, rains hitting the sort of proto Rocky Mountains. Here's some snapshots of um, one, one reconstruction, Ron Blakey's reconstruction of what the North American Western Interior Seaway might have looked like at various times. So uh, the seaway connected uh, from the Arctic to the Gulf of Mexico around 100 million years ago, give or take a few million years. Um, it was going pretty strong by 85 million years. And then um, by about 65 million years, the seaway had started to recede and eventually um, completely drained once you got into the center. This is a reconstruction of, of what the ecosystem in the Western interior might have looked like. I like to ask the question of, was this the most dangerous ocean? We had um, giant marine uh, lizards that were the size of school buses, this Turtle here was the size of a Volkswagen bug. 
Um, and this terrifying looking tuna um, was about 15 feet long. So um, we had a lot of, of large, scary megafauna uh, that lived at the time. However, I primarily study the invertebrates. So in this picture, I study the ammonites. This is a picture of, of two different types of ammonites and a, and a nautiloid, actually. I study the baculites, uh, like this picture uh, towards the top of the frame, belemnites uh, in the bottom left of the frame. I study the bivalves that are hanging out on the bottom, so things like oysters, clams, mussels, and, and rudus bivalves, which are a unique group of bivalves in the Cretaceous that are no longer with us. And then I study um, the record of, of marine snails, like these turtelids on the right and this predatory natissid uh, next to it. So I'm going to show you a lot of pictures now um, from when they lived. So we can do, we can collect these data then by several methods that are not all that different from modern. We can go do field work and collect them from outcrops. We can survey published literature. We can visit museum collections. And we can use online aggregators like the paleobiology database. Um, and increasingly, um, fossil data is also being shared with um, aggregators like GBIF. Also similar to the modern, um, a lot of the existing data is, is old and it may not contain precise latitude and longitude coordinates. And so we need to then georeference these occurrences, which is to say estimate latitude and longitudes based on um, old information. We use online sources uh, to do this kind of estimation. And the one that everybody likes right now is um, this site called Geolocate. There are several others uh, that you can use, but Geolocate uh, at the moment is the So just as an example, this is a plot um, of where Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, the latitude of Charlotte, North Carolina through the last 320 million years. So you have on the left-hand side of the plot, 320 million years ago. On the right-hand side of the plot is today. And you can see from this graph um, that Charlotte, North Carolina has actually modified its latitude by, it looks like about 50 degrees. And so if you collected a fossil that's 320 million years old uh, from Charlotte, you need to take into account uh, that the plates have moved. How do you do this? Again, we use um, these online resources to estimate paleo latitude. The one that everybody likes right now is called paleolatitude.org, and this is how you access it. You put in your modern latitude and longitude. You tell it the age of your rock, and it will uh, perform the, the paleogeographic reconstruction for you um, given a particular paleomagnetic reference frame. Okay, so just uh, to continue with the example from my own research, I've put together a set of occurrences from the Western interior, uh, mostly invertebrate mollusks, but several types of these more charismatic vertebrates as well. The resolution of these data, um, the fossil record can be actually challenging to get down to the species level, but we try our best. So there are several um, groups where the uh, best we can do is um, doing biogeographic analyses on genera, but we use species when possible. Stratigraphic certainty or temporal bin size is at the geologic stage level right now. That's about a 5 million year bin size. That's a fairly large bin size. Species persist somewhere between two and seven million years, so that's going to be okay for some and not okay for others. Um, we're working to increase that resolution, uh, but it can be tricky. And geographically, we're doing pretty well in terms of revolution, resolution. Um, most of, of these localities are minimally uh, georeferenced at the county level, but 
most are actually mile by mile township range and section data. And this is just what it looks like geographically. Um, several people have um, divided the Western Interior into uh, sets of, of biotic provinces, and um, that's on here too. But essentially, it's just a lot of fossil occurrence data uh, throughout uh, available outcrop area. Okay, so the hard part now, estimating paleoenvironmental gradients. Okay, so we want to know then what are the environments like where species occur and where they don't. Again, this has to be spatio-temporally explicit, which is to say we need information with unique where and also unique whens. We need this information uh, to be collected from a set of environmental proxies because we can't go measure the, sea temp the ocean temperature in the Lake Cretaceous. And then, of course, we make these measurements. We collect these data at specific point locations that are shown uh, in this diagram as red circles uh, in our gray outcrop belts. And then we have to interpolate between these observations to create our spatial, our continuous spatial coverages. And this is, again, not different than how it's done uh, with modern or, or more recent time data. Um, however, the, the resolution of these data uh, can be different. So what kinds of environmental layers are we talking about extrapolating from the sedimentary record? We're thinking about things in the marine realm, like substrate grain size, how much clay, silt, or sand is in the sediment. This tells you something about the firmness or soupiness or muddiness of uh, the benthic realm, which is important for critters that crawl around in that soupy, sandy, or hard substrate. We're thinking about things like whether the depositional regime of the area is predominantly siliciclastic or whether it's carbonate based. There's been several marine studies that have shown that species actively prefer one or the other. We try to get proxies for uh, redox conditions, um, things like bio degree of bioturbation is a sedimentological way of knowing if the bottom is oxygenated, if you have a lot of bioturbation, which is to say animals digging around in the sediment, then you can um, infer that the sediment water interface is fairly oxygenated. If you have uh, very perfect little laminations with no evidence of animals walking around, that might suggest that there's low oxygen levels. We look at things like bedding style, how thick are the sedimentary beds uh, that your fossils are deposited in. This is a proxy for the rate of sediment deposition, so thicker would be faster deposition. We use a variety of proxies to try to get at inferred water depth. We use uh, broad sedimentological interpretations um, of using kind of all of these information from the entire sed record to get at distance from shore. And then um, increasingly we're using geochemical proxies for things like temperature and redox conditions to better coast environments. My group has been involved um, in trying to build better geochemical proxies for um, temperature in the Western Interior Seaway in particular. So I had a master's student, uh, Camille Dwyer, who compiled um, uh, oxygen delta 18O stable isotopes globally um, and then collected her own data within the Western Interior and kind of compared the, um, the uh, paleo temperature uh, that she was getting uh, in the Western Interior compared to other parts of the world. Uh, the 18 proxy is known to have a lot of caveats uh, from the influence of vital effects, uh, evaporation regimes, uh, freshwater input, and of course, um, diagenetic alteration, so alteration after the rock is formed. And so new uh, proxies are coming online. This triple oxygen isotope, the CAP, 17 uh, proxy is a new one that is that is starting to be used as well as this cap 47 or the clumped isotope paleothermometer and it's possible that that uh, either separately or in combination that these two proxies are are kind of the wave of the future for more faithful records of paleo temperature all right now the unique uh, sort of data set that you have to collect when you're doing deep time paleo e is a stratigraphic database, which is to say you are trying to look at your species um, occurrences and their relationship to the environment over some amount of space. You need to then also be able to correlate that space 
through time. So I work in the late Cretaceous. This is the age of dinosaurs. Um, it ended dramatically with the KPG mass extinction, where 70 to 75 percent of species went extinct. This was caused by an asteroid impact and or the influence of very large volcanic province um, and kind of segued into the age of mammals. The kind of interesting thing um, from my perspective or the easier thing from my perspective is that paleogeography is approaching modern and so um, North America is almost at the same latitude as it as it was 65 million years ago. All right, so in order to to know when you are in time, um, we rely on stra uh, geologic maps, and this is this is a compilation of um, regional geologic maps that have been triangulated and interpolated um, from the the online database MacroStrat. So each of these different colors reflects rocks of a different age. We can place the Western Interior Seaway on this diagram of rocks in North America. How do you then kind of create this age model and how do you know where you are in time um, when you move across space? We do this essentially by going to lots of different um, point locations and, and um, mapping the stratigraphy so you might go to the Grand Canyon here, you make a map of the rocks in the Grand Canyon through time, like this, this stratigraphic column on the right. And then you use that information from lots of different localities to make a correlation and then be able to say that these rocks are probably the same age. How do you perform this correlation? We use a lot of different metrics to know that, that a, a given set of rocks are the same age or that they're different. One is rock type and character or lithology. So this uh, picture on the left is showing you an A, B, and C place that you might visit and, and draw yourself a stratigraphic column. And then you wanna see how these things are related to each other um, through time. So you compare your three stratigraphic sections on the right here. And the first sort of pass uh, at correlation you might do is to say, well, similar rocks might be of similar ages, so you might use the lithology. Um, the second proxy that we might use to correlate our rocks through time is biostratigraphy. So that it, biostratigraphy is the use of index fossils, so particular species that only last for a very short period of time but are geographically widespread. So if you find a particular index fossil, you know that you are um, looking at a rock of a particular age. We can also use chemostratigraphic records. So we can look at, for example, the carbon stable isotope curve, which is tends to be a global, record a global signal of the carbon cycle. And we can look at the, the wiggles and waggles of the global carbon cycle in each one of our stratigraphic columns and then wiggle match those different, uh, those different columns to, to help us um, correlate the same time periods. And then we can also get at this in a more limited way um, directly with geochronological tools, for example, radiometric dating. So if you have the right rocks uh, with the right minerals, um, for example, volcanic rocks um, that have these radiogenic uh, minerals in them, then you, then you can use um, radiometric dating to actually place a numerical age on your rocks and use that then to correlate uh, across space. So you do this, you go to a bunch of different locations um, and you do a lot of different correlations. Um, and then as a graduate student, uh, you spend a year of your life going through studies that people have performed to come up some, with something that looks like this. So this is an example um, of the stratigraphic correlation uh, database that I put together for the Western Interior Seaway. And this is just several different rock formations that exist in New Mexico. Um, and and this red box is showing you the age, the geologic stage um, that I've assigned to each of these formations based on um, all of the references and the data that's collected and the references on the right. All right, so armed then with all of these data, with your occurrence database, your paleoenvironmental database, and your stratigraphic database, you can now move to applying traditional ENM algorithms to your deep time paleo data. 
So here's an example from my master's student, Agatha Carrier. She was working in the middle Cretaceous um, um, and asking or testing questions of species survivorship and niche stability from the Sanamanian uh, geologic stage, which was about 100 million years ago, to the Turonian geologic stage, which, which was about uh, 95 million years ago. What you're looking at here is, is her occurrence data mapped onto that late Cretaceous outcrop in gray. Her species level data are in red. Her generic level data are in blue. And then the bottom uh, chart is uh, showing you the paleoenvironmental layers that she reconstructed. So she has uh, sa percent sand, percent clay, percent siliciclastics, depositional environment, water depth, and bedding style. And she compiled this data from literature survey, uh, field work, and some outcrop data. Why is the Sanamanian Turonian an interesting place to look at survivorship? Well, I had a, another student, Nick Framuller, uh, look at global diversity of mollusks um, across the, the entire Cretaceous. Um, and this is particularly interesting because the Cretaceous oceans are plagued by um, several periods of, of global um, anoxia. The Sanamanian Turonian boundary is one of these. Um, it's called Ocean Anoxic Event 2. It's associated with a positive carbon isotope excursion, which usually indicates some kind of anoxic event. And Nick's study very nicely shows um, that you have both a decrease in generic and species diversity across this anoxic event, as well as an increase in um, extinction rate across this anoxic event. So then we're interested in the degree to which this diversity decrease is associated with habitat loss or fragmentation caused by that anoxic event. So Agatha uh, put together all of her paleo e components, um, ran Maxent models. Here's an example of what that output looked like. Um, this is the continuous Maxent output um, for the species Mammites nodosoides. It's an ammonite species. Uh, the occurrences of this ammonite are shown here in red. And what this um, continuous model output is showing you is suitable, more suitable habitat in dark colors, less suitable ha predicted habitat in light colors. We apply a least trading presence threshold to convert this continuous estimate into um, a binary set of predictions. Um, using least training presence is actually one of the more conservative uh, ways of applying the threshold, and we, we use more conservative approaches um, because we know uh, the vagaries of, of fossil sampling and preservation. So here's our map then of suitable, predicted suitable habitats in dark blue and predicted unsuitable habitats in light blue based on her model. Okay, so she ran this with uh, 25 different surviving taxa, and she hypothesized that if uh, survivorship was associated um, with uh, geographic or predicted suitable habitat, that she should see stability or an increase in suitable habitat in her survivors, and about half of them showed that. So this is an example of an Ionoceramus clam. Um, the top uh, image is her model output for the Sanamanian. The bottom image is her model output for the Tronian, and there's not really any change in the uh, percent occupation of predicted suitable habitat for this taxon. Here's um, another example of uh, Turtella gastropod, who shows an increase in predicted um, suitable habitat area from the Sanamanian to the Tronian. Similarly, um, she predicted that if you're going to be a surviving species across this oceanic anoxic event, you might be a species that experienced less um, or no modification in, in um, suitable habitat continuity. So increased fragmentation, again, might lead to increased extinction percentage. So of her surviving taxa, the majority of them did show no change or an increase in habitat continuity. So that's shown here for her, the turtelid. Um, and uh, then we move to the extinct taxa. So she had nine um, extinct taxa. Now it's important to recognize that since these taxa went extinct at the Sanamanian and Turonian boundary, 
She could create a model based on species occurrence data in the Cenomanian, and then she used those predictions and projected that prediction onto the Turonian. Okay, so assuming then that niches were stable, she's asking whether there was substantial amounts of predicted suitable habitat that this species could have inhabited. And again, she would have expected that for an uh, extinct taxon that you would get a decrease in predicted suitable habitat area and you would have an increase in habitat fragmentation. So the answer was only about five out of nine of these extinct taxa had small or fragmented ranges in the Sandomanian before they went extinct. And there was very little change in continuity um, or uh, percent predicted suitable habitat when you move across this boundary. So that's interesting. Okay. So then she was also curious, this is a very significant environmental perturbation. What can we say about um, whether species and genera are showing uh, stability in their abiotic requirements across this significant environmental perturbation? So she used the EcoSpat package um, in R to test for niche stability. The EcoSpat package tests this in two different ways. It looks at niche equivalency, which basically asks the question of whether two species have identical niches, which is a very strict test. Um, and then she also tested for niche similarity, which is a much uh, less strict test and asks whether two niches are more similar than random. So here's some results uh, for exogyra. If niche equivalency is happening, then you would expect a statistically significant uh, value down here um, at the bottom. Same for similarity. If uh, niche similarity is observed, you would expect a statistically significant model at the bottom. And then this overlap map is showing you in two-dimensional PC space in the green outline. That's the outline of available environments in the Cenomanian. The red outline is showing you the extent of available environments in the Turonian. The green blob is then the occupation of those environments predicted by the EcoSpat model for that species. And then the red blob is the same, it's the predicted occupation of that environmental space uh, for the Turonian model. Blue then is the overlap. So more overlap than you would expect, more likelihood of having a statistically similar or equivalent result. She looked at uh, 19 genera and two species for this test. Again, they all had to be survivors um, in order to uh, look at how niches may have changed through time. Uh, none of these taxa showed niche equivalency, which is um, what I would have expected given that this, that is a very strict test. And only five genera showed niche statistically uh, significant niche similarities, the Scaphides species being one of those. Um, and you can see that in the PC space overlap diagram, you do have a pretty significant amount of overlap. Okay. Interestingly, the most common observation uh, that she could make across all of these different species uh, niche comparisons through time um, was that most of these species in general were experiencing some degree of niche contraction across the CT boundary. And this was contraction that's observed beyond the sort of contraction that's associated with the modification of environmental space between the, the Cenomian and the Tronian. So what do we take away from this? Global um, uh, molluscan extinction is elevated across this boundary. Survivorship does not seem to be strongly correlated with suitable habitat availability or its continuity, and this suggests that then maybe extinction potential is more, um, more proximally based on the anoxic event itself. And only about a quarter of the taxa that we, uh, that we measured seem to demonstrate niche stability, and all of those were showing niche similarity. Um, and this is an interesting result because it suggests that the sort of standard assumption that species have stable niches across their lifetimes that are so important for so many of our, of our hypothesis tests may not uh, be particularly um, uh, accurate when you're looking at um, evolutionary timescales across the lifetime of a species. And of course, um, this needs to be flushed out by testing more species 
um, and more ge uh, generic pairs uh, and actually trying to, to do this at higher resolution. Okay, so in summary, I hope I've shown you that you can use uh, ENMs to estimate niche parameters in environmental space and distributions in geographic space of fossils. I hope that you take home with you that the, the more recent past GCM-based ENMs are not the same as sediment record-based paleo ENMs, um, kind of the forefront of where we're uh, working in my lab is trying to translate what those similarities and differences are um, using GCMs and, EN and paleo ENMs, sed-based paleo ENMs from the same time periods. Paleo ENMs in deep time are still primarily uh, based in the sedimentary record, and this is because GCM data is less reliable but also less available as you go farther back in time. And therefore, when you're doing paleo ENMs, you need additional components. You need to use presence-only algorithms and evaluation metrics. You need to make sure you're rotating your data points to their paleogeographic positions. You need to reconstruct environmental gradients in geographic space using sedimentological and geochemical records. And then finally, whenever you're making an interpretation of ENM in the fossil record, you need to take into account the taphonomic conditions um, of that record, which is to say the preservation potential, the likelihood uh, that, those, that uh, those fossils have been modified, um, the spatial extent to which you have been able to sample. So then I hope, armed with this information, um, you are as excited as I am to then go out and apply uh, paleo ENM to try to understand abiotic niche dynamics and their importance on species macroevolution. The questions of niche stability, breadth, and phylogenetic conservation are still out there um, and, and need to be better constrained, both in the fossil record and in the modern. Um, and the, how then those traits uh, relate to species survivorship and invasion biogeography is also important low-hanging fruit. And finally, this really allows us to quantitatively start to test the co-evolution of the earth and life, which is to say, we can look at how niche dynamics are being modified across the entire duration of a species, and we can look at these long-term effects of uh, environmental change. And I hope then we can use the past uh, as a guide to the future, which is to say, to help us then inform our predictions of how modern environmental change uh, might be better mitigated, as well as using the past uh, to better understand the history of life on Earth. Thanks very much for your time, is the preferred choice. Now, important to the deep time fossil record is the fact that when you are georeferencing um, your species occurrence data, you have to recognize that over the last 544 million years ago, Earth's plates have moved. <laughs> They've moved very substantially. So the, the latitude and longitude at which you have found your fossil is unlikely to be the same